Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Google Plus Hangout on Air. My name is Matt Villano, and I am the senior editor of Expedia's Expedia Viewfinder blog. It is a real privilege to be with you today, uh, not only because I'm excited about chatting uh, about business travel, but also because we could not have assembled more of a dream team of experts to chat with today about business travel. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I really am going to have to uh, re restrain myself from totally geeking out uh, over the subject today because, uh, quite frankly, uh, we've got uh, a bunch of folks uh, uh, whom I followed for years uh, when, uh, when I'm looking for information about business travel, and I'm really excited to have them here today. So thank you for joining us, uh, listeners. Uh, viewers, thank you for joining us uh, today, uh, experts. Uh, and before we do begin, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our, our panelists. Uh, so, so first off, we've got Chris McGinnis. Uh, Chris is an author, a freelance travel writer, host of the weekly Travel Skills Twitter chat, which is every Friday. And uh, he's also launched the Travel Skills blog this very week. So if you haven't checked that out yet, uh, please uh, make sure you check it out after this event. And um, uh, Chris, uh, uh, give us a wave, say hello. Hey, folks. So there's Chris McGinnis. Uh, we've also today got uh, Barb DeLawless. Uh, Barb is an author, a freelance travel writer, a former reporter with USA Today. And she also has launched a new blog as well. Barb, what is the name of your new blog? It's really hard to remember. It's barbdelawless.com. <laughs> There you go. So check that out, folks, uh, either during today's Hangout or, uh, or following uh, the conclusion of today's event. Uh, we also today are lucky enough to have with us Larry Olmsted, who is uh, an author, a freelance travel writer, and the man behind the Great Life Luxury Travel column on Forbes.com. And uh, Larry uh, is, uh, is a, a, a prolific tweeter, and on Twitter you can follow him at Travel Food Guy. Uh, Larry, uh, say hello this morning. Hello. And Larry, where are you joining us from today? Uh, I'm in Monterey, California. Very I nice. I don't live there. I'm in a hotel. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us. And then finally, we've got Bruce Bush, who's the Senior Vice President and Legal Counsel for National Purchasing Partners. Hi, Bruce. Hi. How are you? Great. Thank you for joining us, Bruce. And uh, thanks to all four of you uh, for joining us uh, again for today's event. So we're, we're talking about business travel, and uh, before we get into uh, sort of the nitty-gritty today, I want to just uh, make sure that all of you viewers are aware of a promotion that Expedia currently is running in celebration of Small Business Week, which is this week. Uh, we, uh, we'd like to bring our hard-working business travelers and uh, an exclusive limited-time offer. Uh, so if you are an Expedia Rewards member, you can enjoy a free meeting space rental, which is $100 value when you sign up with Liquid Space uh, by the end of the week, actually it's by Monday of next week, uh, and you book your meeting space by July 1st. Uh, so Liquid Space, if you don't know about them, they've got meeting rooms and workspaces all over the U.S. So essentially if you're traveling uh, for work, you can rent spaces wherever you go. So check them out. Liquid Space is the name of the partner, and uh, again, uh, it's this uh, great promotion. I will mention it again before the event is over today. So we're talking business travel. I got some great stats this week from the Global Business Travel Association. Mind-boggling stuff. In 2013, uh, more than 450 million people took business trips in the United States alone. And uh, those folks spent more than $270 billion, with a B, on business travel. Uh, this year, 2014, the GBTA estimates that there will be more than 464 million business trips taken uh, by U.S. residents, and that those folks will spend close to $300 billion on business travel. So, I mean, people are, are traveling more and more for work, and uh, again, nobody knows more about, uh, about that experience than uh, our experts today. Let's get right into, into today's discussion. Uh, Chris McGinnis, uh, why don't you start by telling us how many miles you flew in 2013, how many miles you expect to fly this year, and uh, what the highest status level is that you've, uh, you've ever achieved with an airline as right. a result. Okay. Well, uh, last year I was pretty dedicated to a column I had on BBC called Business Trip on BBC.com, 
And that involved uh, going to a lot of different cities around the world and, and writing about what the top business class hotels were, what the top restaurants were, um, you know, some ideas about cultural faux pas and things like that. So I was on the road a lot and taking a big, long international trip once or twice a month. So I probably clocked in pretty close to 100,000 miles. I, I wrote a list here of all the places I went last year. Bangkok, Tokyo, London, Mexico City, uh, Frankfurt, Copenhagen, and of course a lot of domestic travel, Chicago, New York, and my hometown of Atlanta. Um, you know, when you're traveling as a, as a rider, a lot of times uh, you are, you're, you're not earning miles. And so, you know, the, the most I've ever, or the highest um, status I've ever gotten with an airline is gold status. That's probably because I spread my business around a lot. I can't uh, choose one single airline and fly a lot because I've got to write about what's happening with the hometown carriers here, like United or Virgin America or JetBlue or uh, Delta. I spread my business around quite a lot, so I never really get up to the super, ultra, platinum, diamond, elite levels. Right. Right. Well, that's uh, maybe there's a tip in that spreading, uh, spreading, spreading the travel around, and we'll we'll get to some advice uh, later on in the in in the event. But uh, well, that's good to know, Chris. Uh, certainly more miles than I've flown, and I uh, I feel like I'm on the road all the time as well. Barb, uh, well, why don't you give us uh, give us your breakdowns if if you wouldn't mind, please? Yeah, I'll definitely be happy to do that. So, looking at Barcelona, Mexico, Chicago, many trips to Barcelona, I'm looking at about thirty. So not all that much. And like Chris said, um, as a reporter for so many years, I'm not really brand loyal, uh, so I have not been accruing a lot of miles on each one, enough to gain top status for each of them or any of them really. Um, you know, usually I'm taking the cheapest flight and taking, uh, you know, perhaps taking flights that, uh, you know, even different flights on, on the route depending on where I'm going, uh, so I'm not really accruing a lot of miles. So I am not the miles guru. I have to admit it. Sounds great. Sounds great, uh, Larry. Uh, I I know you're you're on the road a ton. Uh, perhaps uh, perhaps you may win the prize here. Uh, what? How many miles have you flown? And in, uh, in, in, did you fly in, in thirteen? How many do you think you're going to fly in fourteen? And uh, and 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 what kind of what kind of status perks are you uh, are you achieving at your best? Uh, apparently, I need to stay home more. Um, uh, in 2014, I, I expect it to be a relatively slow year. I'll probably only fly about 100,000 miles this year. Um, 2013 was my biggest year. I flew close to about 100, between 160 and 175,000 miles. And um, I'm currently platinum on United and gold on Delta. And um, I have bounced around. I've been gold on British Airways and American and U.S. Air. Um, as Chris uh, mentioned, I, I think it's important. Uh, mo most frequent flyer gurus will tell you to stick with one program and get as high, and I could have made Diamond or something if I had got done that, but I like to be uh, elite on more than one alliance because that gives you all the foreign airlines too, so I split. I usually split between um, Star Alliance and either uh, uh, Sky Team or One World. Awesome. Well, thanks, Larry. And, and last but, but not least, uh, Bruce, there you go. Uh, give us a sense um, of, of, of how much you're traveling. I know we, we spoke offline, and, and you're, you're on the road quite a bit as well, Bruce. Yeah, that's nice of you not to call me Lise. Most of, I'm an attorney, so most people do call me Lise, but that's right. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, I, I travel between 75 and 100,000 uh, I have for the past five years. Um, I tend to stick to one airline, uh, Alaska, and so I've been 75 uh, Gold certified K, which is the silver and platinum, I guess. Not with that. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks to all four of you, and I, th I thought that'd be a fun way to get into today's discussion. Uh, we promised our viewers that we'd talk a little bit about trends. So let's pretend that instead of sitting here in virtual space, we're actually all sitting with some distant cousins uh, around the table at a holiday dinner, and. These cousins are very interested in what the four of you do because you're on the road a lot, and it's very exciting to be on the road a lot. And one of the cousins says, sort of blurting out to the group, hey, so what, what trends are you identifying in the world of business travel? Since you're, since you're out there so frequently, what would you say are the top two trends? How would you, how would you tell this relative 
uh, you know, well, listen, here are the top two trends that I've seen in my personal experience uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, Chris, let's start with you again this time. Uh, well, when it comes to business travel, I think that probably the biggest trend this year is what's happening with frequent flyer programs and that they're really uh, turning back to what their, what their original intention was, which is to reward truly frequent travelers, people who travel at least 10 times a year, uh, they typically have an expense account, uh, that kind, of, that type of traveler. They're the ones that are getting the biggest rewards. Um, you know, infrequent travelers uh, or leisure travelers or travel hackers that try to get as much, you know, as much as many miles as they can at the lowest fares possible. They're really not going to get that much that much attention. It's all about how much money you spend, and I think that's going to be the, the the biggest trend going forward this year. Is that if you know if you spend a lot of money you're going to like air travel. If you don't spend a lot of money, it's it's going to get a little bit tougher. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Barb, let's go to you and, and let's uh, let's maybe stick to the biggest trend, the biggest single trend that you've identified. Well, you know, I'm right now I'm at the brand new Marriott Marquis in Washington, D.C. that just opened. So this hotel is a really great example of a big trend that's that's going to be getting bigger from here on in, and that's a room service trend. This hotel opened up without traditional room service so you're going to have people knocking on your door and delivering you a bag of food that's prepackaged like you might take out a Panera Bread and they're doing away with the carts and all the formality and the big fuss and everything and the high prices right because we all hate paying $25 for a burger or a veggie burger in my case so I think this is going to be a big trend going forward it was a year ago that in what at during NYU a hotel conference that uh, the Hilton in New York uh, talked about doing the same thing so it's only a matter of time before we see this catch on but here's the most interesting thing I was talking to the general manager here yesterday and he was saying you know hotels lose money on room service even though it's pricey for a number of reasons because it's very labor intensive but what's really pushing this right now is that consumers business travelers who traditionally would order a meal in their room at eight o'clock when they get back from a long day of meetings they're increasingly using these apps like uh, seamless is one of them there are several others that gather the restaurants uh, you let them hit pick a, a menu from a local restaurant and they deliver to the guest so you know if I'm at this Marriott I may order from uh, you know, pick a hotel in Washington D.C. Uh, you know, Matchbox Pizza, and they might deliver to me here. So I just bypass the room service system completely. So I think that's something that business travelers have been doing because they're tired of the high prices and the long waits, and they don't want the fuss, and they just go for these apps. So it's it's pretty interesting. I think it's going to just pick up from here on out. That's really amazing, Barb, and I love that you uh, you're reporting from the field live on this hangout. So. Uh, uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, pretty neat to 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 hear uh, you uh, uh, giving us some news that you've just uh, you you've just reported in the last 24 hours. So thanks for that, Larry. What what single trend would you identify as the largest uh, to hit the world of business travel in the last 12 months? Well, I would definitely go with Chris on the restructuring of the frequent flyer programs and the associated changes at lounges and even the changes in um, a lot of the credit card programs, both the airline and the non-airline ones. But since Chris already took that, I'm going to give a shout out for PreCheck. Um, pre uh, a year ago, I was the only one in the line and it was only at major airports. Now, a lot of people have it. It's everywhere. I've used PreCheck out of the Biloxi Gulfport Airport. I mean, um, and I think it's great. I, I, I wish people would stop getting it for personal reasons, but everyone should get it. I totally agree. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm not currently a member, but uh, I've had the privilege of being uh, being being led into the line uh, in Las Vegas a couple of times, and it really makes a huge difference to, to keep on my, my sneakers as someone who is an obsessive, compulsive shoelace tire. Uh, Bruce, uh, 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 since you're on the road so much, I know you've got you've got some insight into this question as well. From your perspective, uh, you're traveling for some different reasons uh, than than the three uh, fellow journalists uh, on on the hangout today. Uh, what would you say is is the is the biggest trend that you've identified in the last year for business travel? Yeah, well, I I would agree with Preacher. Um, that's a, anyone that's gone through that. It's heaven, and it's so simple. Well, is it a big deal to take off not take off your shoes? It is when you have to do it so often, right? So Preacher's a big deal. Um, I would actually, and, and these three, you know, they're experts in the field, so this is probably two years old for them, but to the, to the everyday business travel, it's really the, the use of apps. 
um, both to get on, both to get online, you know, on the uh, airplane, but let alone check in, check out at the, at the hotels. Um, I haven't really used the apps um, with the with rental cars, but uh, as far as lodging and the airlines, they're they're working great. Terrific, terrific. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for your input on that first question. Uh, since we talked about loyalty programs, we touched on lounges and sort of what's happening in, in, in the world of, 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 of VIP lounges at, at airports. I want to touch on another trend that I've identified, uh, and that is the, the, the trend among international airlines for giving flyers, frequent flyers, more options to lay flat uh, on long journeys. Um, the airlines would have us take a big, huge deal. To what extent is it really that big of a deal? Uh, Larry, let's go to you first. Um, it is a big deal. You, you, you can really sleep in that alleviate a lot of the jet lag issue. Um, nowadays, I think if I'm flying to the Pacific Rim, or any kind of really long Australia, Asia, I want to be in late that bad. I sort of can't go back. Um, um, yesterday I flew Boston to San Francisco in first class on United, and I was like, please let it be late flat legs. It was the oldest plane in the fleet. But, um, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think the business class lay flat, which brings it to a lot more people, is a lot more important than like the fleets in the sky. Okay. My, well, my, saying, my saying is, once you, once you go flat, you never go back. And I think... Larry, Larry just said that. I mean, once you've you know you've you've been able to get sleep on a completely horizontal surf surface on an international flight, it's hard to sit and even even in a chair that that reclines almost all the way, but is still at an angle. That's difficult after being completely flat. So it's something that has definitely uh, captured the hearts and minds of business travelers, and people definitely make their decisions on which airline to choose whether or not they're going to get a true live flat surface. Yeah, I'll just add to that that um, it makes such a difference internationally for the long haul that I won't use them when I actually turn into the uh, flyer miles. I won't, I won't use for anything but international uh, first class or business class long haul because I think you're doing the most thing for your different fire flyer uh, using those versus what you That's right. Well, wow, that's uh, and I know we're having a feedback issue, issue, folks. Uh, so uh, just bear with us here. It's uh, something I'm sure that uh, Google will will uh, straighten out before too long. For some reason, Chris McGinnis is the only one that doesn't have a feedback. So, I, I, it's my it's my brand new Mac. There you go. It's a travel skill shout out there. Uh, Barb, I want to get your input on this. Maybe just speak a little bit more slowly than you normally would. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So I agree well, I that, that once you've gone, once flat, you've gone it's flat, it's terrible, it's terrible to, go back. to go back. As I was going back and forth to Barcelona this year, I flew back, I flew back. Uh, I flew back. Uh, I flew flat once flat and I was spoiled. I was spoiled. After that, it was After very hard, was very hard. Just to sleep and relax, relax and, and just enjoy the flight. Enjoy so the flight. after that, so then after that, I had to decide whether to go KLM, to KLM or Delta. Decided, sorry, this is so hard to talk. Um, figure and figure out which economy class or economy plus class was the best because flat just spoiled me forever. Hey, you know, Matt. One one thing I, I had here on my notes that I wanted to mention about uh, the lie flat seats. You know, a lot of people think, a lot of non-business travelers think that they're really out of their reach because you know, fares across the Atlantic or the Pacific can be five to ten thousand dollars round trip in business class, but the good thing is that airlines uh, do offer the lie flat seats at a discount, a deep discount uh, during the late summer when typically business travelers stay home and also during the uh, the winter holidays when business travelers stay home. So if you if you look hard enough you can find some uh, you know business class fares in the you know maybe eighteen hundred to three thousand dollar range versus you know well about five thousand. Terrific. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for that input, Chris. And um, by the way, the sound did catch up with you as well, Chris. So no one, no one is immune. But uh, we're just gonna gonna power through here and uh, and and keep chatting. Uh, I, I wanna. There are a number of issues I want to touch on. But before we get off the, the this the, the subject of air travel, 
Uh, packing is always an issue that uh, Expedia rewards members, uh, Expedia customers, and readers in general are curious about when it comes to sort of hacking hacks. Uh, so, so Barb, we'll go to you. Uh, maybe start speaking slowly first, and hopefully uh, uh, everything will be resolved at this point. But Barb, what, what, are, what is your favorite packing hack when, uh, when you've got one carry-on bag and you need, to, you need to bring a whole business trip's worth of clothes uh, with you in that bag? First of all, I ignore the rules. I am a female business traveler. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the heck with the rules. But no, typically I do like to check in, and I really do not want to check ever. So normally I will put in um, a dress, uh, you know, a blazer, wear one blazer if I'm going away for extended stay in my carry-on, and um, I'm sorry, in my suit, uh, suit bag. And then after that I've got a number of matching items that I roll up really, really tightly with um, newspaper or some sort of tissue paper or even plastic bags if I don't have anything else on hand. And things come out flawless, they're not wrinkled. Um, I have a lot of stuff, more than I need typically, but at least I'm not, uh, you know, too nervous about not having something or if I spill a shirt, I've, I've got another one. So I maximize, maximize, maximize in one single bag. And, and my suit suit bag and just make sure I make sure all of my pieces coordinate awesome awesome great tips uh, Bruce so uh, share with us uh, your number one packing hack uh, for business trips well I have two the, the first I'll go back to apps um, if, if, if you don't check the weather you're crazy you think you uh, you're bringing all kinds of things you don't need to bring so probably the first one is checking the weather for the destination. Um, that's the easy one. Um, I got to tell you, my other one, which is going to follow anybody else's, is uh, I have to make sure I bring a baseball hat. And the reason I bring a baseball hat is because the the, the uh, quality of sleep on the airplane, if I cover my eyes with that baseball cap over my head, is far superior to anything else. And so, um, and and I didn't follow my own rule by mistake today because I'm actually a day trip in San Diego. That's why you've seen the change in background because uh, um, we had noise issues at the other location, and I forgot my baseball cap. And I'm telling you, I, I that was worse than forgetting my pants. Um, that's important. But otherwise, the the, the basics. You know, um, if you keep if you keep the thing half packed, you know you're gonna bring everything you need to bring. Don't bring too. I wear a baseball hat to cover up my bed head when I go to the hotel breakfast bar to get my cup of coffee in the morning. That's why I bring one. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the Chris McGinnis secret uh, to, uh, <laughs> to business travel. Uh, Chris, no, in terms of packing, uh, what, what, uh, what, what is your sort of number one uh, go-to strategy for, uh, for, for, for preparing uh, or, or getting the most uh, into your bag for a business trip? Um, it's pretty easy for me being from San Francisco because everyone wears black gear and uh, I, I carry that with me when I'm on the road. I wear, uh, you know, almost all you know, black pants and black sweater. I might, you know, I'll have the, the shirt will be a different color, but I usually go um, all black. It, it, you know, it's, it's good for stains. You know, it doesn't get stained. Um, and I can, when you wear all black, you only have one color of leather. So I have a black belt and black shoes and that, that does me well, you know, when I when I'm out of a carry-on. Awesome, awesome. And Larry, uh, when you're packing for for a business trip, uh, you're you're trying to get everything into one bag. What uh, what's your strategy? Well, uh, like uh, what Chris said, I would try to pick one color shoe you're going to wear the whole trip, whether it's brown or black, and then do the belt and everything to match that, um, rather than than multiples. Uh, I say wear your suit jacket on the plane. That's the hardest thing to pack and uh, very easy to put in the overhead, even if it's full, flat. Um, but to be honest, uh, a lot of a lot of business travelers really pride themselves on the carry-on thing. I do not. I almost always check. I like to have a lot of stuff with me. And um, uh, I've never had a bag lost. I really don't think it's a big deal to pick up your luggage at the end rather than dragging it around when you change planes. And uh, when I travel internationally, I like to, to dress up a lot because most Americans don't. So I bring a lot of clothes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's switch gears. Uh, by the way, if I may add, before we do switch gears, um, I am obsessed with Ziploc bags. And I don't only uh, use them for my toiletries, but 
I will literally, I think I've used the same gallon size storage Ziplocs for three years or so, and I use those to scrunch down clothes and take all the air out of them, and uh, you can pack a heck of a lot more in, into a, a one carry-on suitcase uh, that way than, than you would otherwise. So that's, that's my travel hack. But uh, again, I don't know nearly as, as much about uh, business travel as the rest of you guys. Barb, did you have something to add before we moved on? Yeah. Matt, I was going to ask you something in terms of, you know, it's so efficient when you're packing on the way out. What about when you're coming back home? Can you fit everything back into the Ziploc bags? That's what I have the biggest problem with. I, packing to go back home is usually just a nightmare. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I can, and, and I started doing this a couple of years ago because I'm a runner, and I, I try and squeeze a run in on the last day of, of, of every business trip, and so the problem I was having was I'd get everything into my bag, and then I'd put these, you know, smelly, sweaty running shorts on top, and everything would just be disgusting by the time I got home. So all of a sudden it occurred to me, hey, if I bring these Ziploc bags and just put everything in the Ziplocs, including the sweaty stuff, then it's not a problem. So, um, yeah, and I'll go through the process of, you know, pushing the bags down, and they make a hideous squeaking noise, which I'm sure has all of the neighbors' uh, concern. But um, anyway, Barb, since, since, uh, since, since you've chimed in, the next question I, I'd like to ask uh, has to do with hotels, and there you are uh, at this wonderful new hotel. Um, you, you talk about room service. That's an amenity, and, and that Barb is, uh, is celebrating the launch of her blog with this wonderful hat. Uh, what would you say, Barb, what, what, are, what are your go-to amenities as far as hotel amenities are concerned when you're traveling for business? Is it a 24-hour gym? Is it uh, you know uh, something as simple as in-room checkout? What what are you looking for as a business traveler from a hotel in terms of amenities? Oh well, I have one big issue with this. I'm always looking for a quality. I'm glad you enjoy this, Chris. <laughs> um, I'm always looking for a really fantastic quality hair dryer, and it's the easiest way to win over female business travelers. And I really want to be serious right now. Hotels just have to get a great hair dryer. It's that plus a flat iron. And every time I tell hotel people this, I say, "Come on, just get a flat iron, a great hair dryer." They say, "Flat iron people, women will be skeeved out because they're dirty." I said, "Believe me, if you have ever known women with hair that frizzes out on a humid day, they will take out a, free, a, a one of the flat irons and use it, if, even if it's in the trash. We don't care. We just need a flat iron." So. That's my biggest pet peeve. We stayed at Palace Resorts in Mexico recently uh, at Moon Palace, and they had she hair dryer. It was phenomenal. It's not the kind of place where I need to do my hair and then get a flat iron, but they had that too. And I think for me, that's the biggest thing. If I find it, which is very rare, but usually it's going to be the gym for me. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, uh, Larry, let's go to you. Your go-to amenity uh, for, 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 from a business travel hotel, perhaps like the one you're staying in right now? Uh, well, it's interesting because the one that I'm staying in right now, much to my surprise, did not have free Wi-Fi. Uh, oh. So I am paying handsomely to chat with you right now. Um, but uh, in, in my experience, um, I mean, everybody wants Wi-Fi. It's become almost so ubiquitous that that it that it, it sounds like like to me, it's like you want to have power or you want to have lights or air conditioning. But um, almost all hotels that are not high-end luxury hotels have free Wi-Fi now. Uh, it's kind of weird that the only ones that still charge for it are the ones you pay eight hundred dollars a night to stay in. Um, but but I mean that's that's like the only thing that I would say is is make or break. I, you know you, you need to be connected now. Uh, otherwise, I think business tra some business travelers really like having the free breakfast. Um, you know there's uh, things like that. Like you mentioned the in-room checkout, it's very personal. It, it, you know uh, I I don't I'm not brand loyal, and I stay in a lot of different kinds of hotels, so I don't have a one must-have amenity. That sounds good. I want to I want to go to Bruce next, but I'd I'd like to add that if I were ever to run for president. The, uh, the, the the main tenet of my platform would be free Wi-Fi for all, uh, because uh, I I agree, <laughs> Larry. It just it really gets my goat that you know some some of these hotels and it's inevitably the ones that are charging the most uh, money for for per night are, are are also you know getting you dinging you fifteen bucks for for Wi-Fi. But uh, Bruce, what would you say are the amenities you seek when you travel for business uh, uh, from a hotel? 
Well, first, I suggest if you run for president, you consider switching platforms to flat irons because it sounds like you get half the voting right there. <laughs> but, uh, free breakfast. I think what Larry said, free breakfast, I think is uh, the single biggest deal. The other thing that I don't think other hotels can really help that, that I care about is the fitness room is great and everything, but it's nice to get out and walk. And so actually location is a big deal for me. Um, I, I, I want I want. I don't want it in a you know, a, a business park or a, or an you know, industrial center. Um, and so, actually, location uh, matters. Awesome. And Chris, uh, I, we know that you love uh, you love breakfast, uh, free breakfast, because you've you've already admitted to wearing a, a baseball cap uh, to them. But uh, but but what other amenities are you looking for from a hotel when you travel for work, Chris? Yeah, well, yeah. Free breakfast, free Wi-Fi are great. I get those when I stay at Westerns a lot. That's why I like them. Um, I think that the most important thing that, that a hotel could do for me is to give you a room with windows that open to the outside. I hate getting into a room. I was in Boston last week. It was a beautiful weekend in Boston. The weather was great. The birds were chirping. I wanted to get in my room and throw open the window and, and you know soak it all in, and the window was locked. No way to, to, uh, to open those windows. So. Um, I always ask when I check in if I can have a room with a door or a window to the outside, and it's it's something that I, I wish that I remembered to ask when when I'm actually booking the hotel. It's very important. I sleep better. It just feels better to have that fresh air instead of that circulated path that you get a lot of times. Man, awesome. man, I, I just want to jump back in and mention coffee makers. Um, I'm a huge fan of the in-room coffee maker. I know Chris talked about going down just to get a cup of coffee. Um, and I've noticed a lot more hotels now are moving to a lot nicer machines. They have either like the K-Cup or the Nespresso machines. Um, mm -hmm. This hotel right here, it has, has like the Keurig machine. And I don't like to use, wouldn't like to use those at home because they generate so much waste. But, uh, but for hotels, they're great. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I, I agree. And I, I, I will never forget the hotel that I stayed in recently. I won't name any names. But um, they charged me for every pod I used. Which oh. I just thought was, I mean, like the ultimate party foul, right? It's like yeah. if you're going to give me these pods, then you better believe I'm going to use every one of them, and you better not charge me for them. Oh, please name the name. No, yeah. I, can't do that. I can't do that. I can't. I'll tell you offline. I can't do that. <laughs> um, but let's talk a little bit about rental cars. Uh, obviously, uh, when you book on Expedia, the best way to save the most money is to bundle, uh, get uh, flight and hotel and rental car together. Uh, when you're traveling for business, uh, sometimes that's not an option. Uh, but but when we talk about rental cars, uh, I know a question that always comes up is is the lost damage waiver. And um, you know, essentially, uh, travelers are always wondering: Is this something that I should take if work's paying just to cover myself, or is it is it is it a ripoff no matter who's paying for it? Uh, and so, so uh, uh, Bruce, we haven't started with you yet, so I'll go to you first since you've got a legal background as well. Um, how much does the LDW actually protect you, and, um, and, and, and should business travelers be concerned about that? So you're protected otherwise, as it is, under your own insurance. So really the, the strongest point for doing the LDW is, is that it's not hitting your own insurance. It's hitting the rental car company, so there's not, if you're concerned about a claim. You know, to be honest, in my opinion, either your company is going to support that or it's not. And so, it, for for most people, tend that really tends to not be a decision, um, other than personally if they're going for leisure. But but as far as business, it tends to be more a business decision. But 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 certainly you're covered outside of that LDW. Um, and 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 this has nothing to do with my legal take, but my uh, but my I guess my frugalness is that. Um, a lot about a lot with insurance these days nationally is you know is double and triple coverage. I'm not a big fan of double and triple coverages on anything, and certainly uh, LDW is is just that. And so I think that you know it, there's a there's a there's a value to it. Um, um, you know, if something were to happen, you're worried about hitting your personal insurance. Um, but the, the uh, um, it, it, in my opinion, it tends to be double coverage. Okay, great. Great. You know, I actually uh, there are a couple other points I want to get to here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move ahead unless anybody has this uh, brilliant nugget of insight about the LDW that that, that they want to. I would like to say something. Yeah, go ahead, Larry. 
Bruce is definitely right about the insurance. That this is the question I get the most about car rentals: is should I take the insurance? And you're, you, the first thing you need to do is call your own insurance company and ask them what the coverage is. But the problem, what most people don't realize, is a lot of uh, U.S. Uh, car insurance policies don't cover you outside of the contiguous 48 states. So even if you go to Hawaii, you're not covered. Uh, if you go to Puerto Rico. Certainly, if you go anywhere else in the world, if you live in New York State, you're actually covered in every U.S. Um, state and Commonwealth, including like the Vir U.S. Virgin Islands. But that's rare, so it, it becomes much more important when you leave the United States. Good to know. Uh, and that's true. Just one other thing, you know, certain credit cards cover it, certain credit cards do not. Um, but even when you are covered by a credit card, um, it, it it's secondary. Um, and so there's there's some hassle there, even if you are covered by that. So it's not like LDW, you know, it, it's a no-brainer, don't do it. Um, uh, and there's, there's certain reasons to it. I totally agree with Larry. Internationally, it's kind of a different ball game. I, I think it's still, I think you're balancing the, uh, the uh, plus and minuses there. Okay, great. Um, let's move on. Chris McGinnis, uh, you travel um, pretty much... Uh, at least once a week, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I know you're on your devices quite a bit when you're on the road. Uh, how do you manage battery life of, of these devices when you travel for business? What's your strategy? Well, you know, luckily, uh, battery management is, is becoming less of an issue. I, I, I mentioned before I'm, I'm talking to you guys today on a brand new Mac, uh, or MacBook, and a uh, MacBook Pro, and it you know, I, I have it seems like unlimited battery life on this thing. Even though I'm, you know, I'm online, I'm on GoGo on the planes, and I know that that Wi-Fi uses a lot of battery life. But I haven't I haven't run out of uh, battery uh, on this so far. For my iPhone, I do have an extra battery on a, a little kind of wraparound device called a Mophie, and uh, that provides extra battery power. It's especially helpful when I'm traveling on business because I'm not always around to plug. But you know another good thing, and one of the we were talking about trends earlier. Um, you know the travel industry has really responded to business travelers' need for more plugs. So nearly every airport, uh, hotel, uh, even on the plane now, you you know you can find a power plug or a USB port to keep yourself plugged in. It's rare um, in the business travel experience that you're not somewhere near a plug where you can kind of you know get a few extra minutes of juice. Yep. Yeah, Barb. Uh, how about you? Uh, when when you're traveling, how do you manage uh, battery life? And um, and uh, to what extent have you had experience with these solar chargers, if if at all, Barb? Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't had experience with solar chargers. But like Chris said, everywhere I could get juice, I get it. And you know, the airports have been so great lately. And I kind of purposefully am not supplementing my battery power because I want to test wherever I travel to see how easy it is to charge. You know, if there's a hotel, like right now I'm sitting and I'm looking at the, the outlet. So this is fantastic. I, I'll plug in right now. But if it's going to take me several minutes to find an outlet, and if I'm in a restaurant, then I know in my head that I can talk about them at some point and it's in not a positive light because that's not business traveler friendly. You know, there are some hotels that even after spending millions of dollars on renovations, they have not put in the outlets that are needed for us uh, because they don't want to shut the hotel down because jackhammering is going to be too expensive and too noisy. So it's not a no-brainer. This is taking the industry a while to get their arms around. Um, so at this point, I'm just going with what I, whatever I can kind of manage. And I'm, I'm always plugged in, so I'm not, it's rare that I'm dying. Okay, great. Larry, uh, real quickly, any, anything to add on the subject of battery management while you're traveling? Uh, Chris is right. It's getting hard to run. I can't imagine like my MacBook Air running out on a flight anymore. Um, but uh, I think the biggest thing is again, if you travel internationally, is to have some sort of an adapter that will charge more than one thing off of one international adapter, which is what I do now. I bring just one plug adapter, but I can I can do my my camera, my phone, and my um, laptop simultaneously. Great, great. We've got a question from a listener. I want to make sure I incorporate that into today's discussion before we begin to wind things down, which is going to happen in a few mo minutes here. Uh, the question pertains to upgrades. Obviously, uh, all of you travel uh, so much or travel enough that uh, you uh, likely can upgrade when you'd like, uh, obviously uh, pending availability. What advice can you offer to other travelers, both business travelers and, uh, and, and perhaps just general travelers, about sort of maximizing the potential for upgrades and 
getting the best upgrade when you do upgrade. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. Um, well, I think the reality these days, I'm not, I'm not sure, I didn't see the question, but a lot of times people, they, they, they say they want to talk about upgrades, but the, what they really want to talk about is free upgrades. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, there's really no such thing as a free upgrade anymore. In the olden days, you know, you could smile at a flight attendant or bring a box of chocolates on board and maybe get an upgrade, but that just doesn't happen anymore. Uh, you know, the airlines are, are you know, now pre-assigned uh, upgrades and, they, and the first class cabin is always full based on your status. So the most important thing you can do is, uh, you know, fly an airline a lot in order to get uh, status to, to get that upgrade. Or you can pay for it. If you know that there's uh, an upgrade available ahead of time, a lot of airlines will, will, let, you, will let you upgrade. I mean, I, I frequently fly from here to Los Angeles on Virgin America and can upgrade to first class at around cocktail hour for $35 and you get nice cocktails and tapas and everything on the on the flights back and forth. To me that's money well spent and um, you know so it's worth looking into you know what you can pay. Ask how much you can pay. Don't go in and ask how much you can get for free. Okay. Uh, Barb, anything to add there on the, on the subject of upgrades? Yeah, and in terms of hotels, um, I agree. You know, you're not really getting free ones anymore, especially now that occupancies in most cities are just really up there, and rates are getting higher. Uh, you know, hotels have more pricing power now. But what I would suggest is that you look for ways to pay. Like Chris said, increasingly hotels are eyeing this new technology where you can upgrade and, and buy um, a nicer room the day of. Uh, you know, maybe even on your app. And you know, it may only cost thirty bucks or something like that. So watch for technology like that, where it makes it easier to secure an upgrade, uh, either in advance or when you arrive. Terrific, uh, Larry. Uh, anything? Uh, anything from your perspective in terms of, of, of upgrades? Yeah, I mean, I think Chris was right in that it's it's become about status is how you get the upgrades, and then you know, the only real way to manage that is is to try to avoid the really big hub airports, like if you're gold on United and you're flying out of Denver, you're probably still not going to get upgraded because half the people flying out of Denver are platinum. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it does come down to where you're flying, but um, the only time I know that you could still sort of wrangle an old-fashioned free upgrade is when something goes wrong, like when they're rebooking you uh, and you say, you know, okay, well, I want to be in first if you're going to bump me, that kind of thing. They, they have some flexibility on, but, yeah, you can't show up, smile at the counter and give them flowers. Chris, I remember you once told me about that. Uh, yeah. It doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Bruce, when you're on the road, uh, uh, what, yeah. what, uh, how, how do you manage upgrades, and, and what advice can you offer uh, other yeah, travelers? Yeah, well, I have a pretty high, I have a high status, um, but, but we're talking about free upgrades because I agree. I think that's what, what the question is. And there's a couple things. Some airlines do. If it, in case of a tie, it's whoever buys the ticket first, um, and so plan ahead, buy your tickets earlier than you know, as early as you know you'll need them. And uh, um, and often now you can cancel. And there's no cancellation charge if you're, if you're a high enough level. Um, and the other thing I do is there's a lot, there's a lot of flights now to the same destination, but close to the same time. And if you just look at the seats, you, you, know, you get on Expedia, and then you look at the you see availability on two flights that are roughly the same time. And, and one's one is uh, uh, first class is almost uh, full, and the other one no seats are taken. And you pick the other one, you have a better shot at getting the uh, getting the upgrade. Terrific, terrific. Well, folks, we are just about out of time, so uh, before we do sign off, I just want to reiterate the promotion that I mentioned at the beginning of the event, uh, again, in celebration of Small Business Week. Uh, sign up for Expedia Rewards, and as a member, you can enjoy a free meeting space rental when you sign up with Liquid Space uh, by May 19th, uh, so long as you book your meeting space by July 1st, uh, 2014. Uh, and that free meeting space rental is $100 value. So check it out, sign up for Expedia Rewards, uh, and then, of course, sign up with Liquid Space as well. Uh, before we do sign off, I want to uh, also reiterate uh, some, of the, uh, some of the blogs, the new blogs that, uh, that we mentioned on today's chat. Uh, Chris McGinnis, of course, just launched Travel Skills, and Chris, it's travelskills.com. That's right. Okay, and then Barb uh, Delalis just launched her blog as well. Barb, it's, it's just your name, barbdelalis.com. It is, and if it's okay, I'll spell it, B-A-R-B-D-E-L-O-L-L-I-S dot com. So it's just like my Twitter name with dot com. Excellent. And then, Larry, for folks to keep tabs on you, 
I, I know you tweet at Travel Food Guy. That's your handle, Travel Food Guy. And the name of your column on Forbes.com again, Larry? It's called The Great Life, and the uh, address is kind of cumbersome, so the easiest way is just to Google The Great Life Forbes, and you'll get there. Okay, great. Well, again, uh, today uh, we were we were educated uh, by our, our four panelists, uh, Bruce Bush, uh, Barb DeLawless, Chris McGinnis, and Larry Olmsted. I thank all four of you. I feel like uh, I... Uh, I, I was the fifth wheel here on uh, on an NBA dream team today. Uh, so thanks again uh, for your for your input, uh, listeners. Uh, hopefully we, we taught you a thing or two, and uh, uh, we hope to see you back uh, not only on the Expedia view, uh, viewfinder blog, but also on Expedia uh, for all of uh, your travel needs from here on out. Uh, again, on behalf of Expedia, I'm Matt Bellano. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you uh, on your next business trip, and we'll see you around. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.